Sanction Scanner sponsorluğunda üretim bandının yeni bölümüne hoş geldin. Selam üretim bandı dinleyicisi. Üretim bandı aslında bir podcast'ten daha fazlası. Biz aktif bir topluluğuz. Ürün geliştirme ve şirket yönetimi ile alakalı konularda kendi aramızda konuştuğumuz ve yeni şeyler öğrendiğimiz aktif bir Slack platformumuz var. Katılmak istersen üretimbandı.com/slack linkine giderek topluluğumuza giriş yapabilir. Sadece topluluğa özel oluşturduğumuz içerik ve etkinliklerden faydalanabilirsin. Unutmadan topluluk üyeleriyle paylaştığımız İki haftada bir yayınladığımız bültenimize de bekleriz. üretimbandı.com slash bülten linkinden bültene kaydolabilirsin. Keyifli öğrenmeler. Hello everyone and welcome to the new episode of Üretim Bandı. Today I have a guest from Barcelona. Hi Itamar, welcome. Hi Erwan, it's great to be here. For people who don't know Itamar, Itamar Gilad is a product coach, he's a consultant, and he's now an author. Uh, his new book is coming out. The book is uh, called Evidence Guided, Creating High Impact Products in the Face of Uncertainty, which we'll talk about today. Uh, Itamar has been working with a bunch of different companies, but he's also worked at companies like Google and Microsoft and product teams, and he's worked on products that you've probably used, uh, Gmail and Google Plus and all that. Uh, so I'm sure you have a bunch of stories and some of those stories we've actually read in the book. So, um, by the way, great book and thank you for sharing it with us. Um, how was the experience of writing that book? First off, thank you for being an early reader. Uh, that really helped me. That actually gave me a lot of, uh, evidence how to improve the book over the years. Uh, it's a really hard process. It, it took me half, four and a half years. It's definitely the hardest project I ever worked on. And uh, it's very satisfying to deliver. But during the process, it was hard. And it's a bit waterfallish. You know, you need to, to start thinking of a big idea and start writing. And you can do betas in the middle. You can kind of test the product on people. You can test the concept. But most of the time, you're developing. You're writing. You're, you're editing alone. And that's kind of hard for me because I was used to a more interactive mode of development. But I mean, in a sense, you were in, you had an advantage because you've actually been written, you've written a lot of things on your blog and you've actually shared these, some of these models online in your blog as well. So these, these have been tested and you've gotten feedback on the models and um, you've gotten feedback on the blog posts as well. So even then you're saying that it, it was a very difficult process. Exactly. Yeah, I was kind of playing the play the uh, the playbook because I was initially, as I became a, a coach and consultant in 2017, I started trying out some of these concepts that I brought from Google with my clients, and I saw what worked, and I mutated it until I had a model, a framework, which I call GIST: Goals, Ideas, Steps, and Tasks. Y- you read the book, you know about it, mm-hmm. but we can talk a little bit about it if you want. And and then I started writing about it in articles, in Twitter, in, in LinkedIn, in various formats. And I saw that it resonated with people. Again, it gave me feedback about what's not clear. Uh, then I, I had a series of workshops that I still give on these topics. And I got more direct feedback and from my, my coaching as well. So all of this theoretically sets you up to success. You write a book. It's very simple. You know all about it. But in reality, things are very different. And we know this from projects. Sometimes you do minor things that seem to lead. But when you do the real thing, you're surprised. You, you discover it's more how to do than you thought. You discover that, that you run into challenges you didn't expect. You discover people react to it in different ways. So I had to rewrite the book at least three times and pivot it. And that's normal in every product. I think it's a reflection of what we do as well in software. What was the most surprising thing? I was surprised first off when I started, I thought people don't know the theory as much as I thought, but it turned out people actually knew the theory. Uh, everyone read Marty Kagan, everyone read the other leaders, Lean Startup, etc. Or at least they were informed about it. The challenge was actually how to put this into practice in my company, in, in a realistic company. How do I get people to not optimize for output, but for outcomes? How do I get my delivery team, so to speak, to turn into a discovery team as well? how to get the engineers and the, the designers interested in the users and the, the business, how to get managers to realize they cannot plan the future, just, you know, invent a bunch of ideas, put them into the strategy, put them into the roadmap and say, this is for sure what we need to do. 
how do you change this whole culture? Uh, and that was actually a much tougher thing to write about because it's, it is really hard. I don't think anyone cracked it, but I'm trying to give as much as I can inside the book addressing this particular question. I think one thing that I like about the, the GIST model, and which, I mean, we met in May 2022, in London for a, for a training session of Marty Kagan. But even before then, I knew you from the GIST model. I followed your uh, blog post. And the reason why the model made sense for me uh, was because, you know, with, with the product OKRs, I was always having, it was challenging for me because it was very difficult to get the big idea down to the level of basically issues on a project management tool. Like there are several layers in between that you have to, like there are big leaps that you have to make in order to get realistic about a revenue goal, let's say, or a churn goal, or like, you know, customer acquisition cost goal, something like that, a, re a business goal, basically. So the just even like the visualization and the, the labels and the titles that you gave of goals, ideas, steps, and tasks, which is what gist is just even seeing that and you know there was a light bulb light bulb basically when i saw that it was just like huh okay this makes sense like there are different levels from the revenue to what we're doing right now so that was very helpful for me and the second thing is i think this was as i grew as a pm i realized that one of my roles is actually managing the uncertainty uh because at first i thought uh, falsely But at first I thought that my job was to find the right solution or the right answer and provide it to the team, make sure that it goes out to the world. Later in my career, I realized that I'm not going to find the right answer uh, because first of all, I'm just one person with one set of skills or one background, let's say. And the market is a very, very complex organism. So I'm not looking for the right answer, but I'm trying to look for an environment where I minimize the risk or minimize the uncertainty. So that resonated with me, what you wrote. And even before, like in your blog post, like, because you put the uncertainty at a very high topic. It's like, it's in the name of the book, obviously, but it's also in everything that you write about. So uncertainty was, is a big theme for you, as I see. Yeah, because I, I, I made the same mistake myself so many times. I came with a lot of certainty and a lot of confidence to my team or to my group. And I said, Let's build this thing. And it turned out to be wrong. It turned out I didn't have a crystal ball and no one has. So that's why I think Malti Kagan gave us a really good concept called discovery. Like you need to discover the right product and then you need to deliver it. And um, in a way, this same concept exists in design thinking, exists in Lean Startup, exists even in growth. It's constantly a process of discovery. And then when you discover, you act on what on the evidence. That's why the book is called Evidence Guided. We let the evidence guide us, not dictate to us, not tell us what to do, but inform us. And through evidence, we can make better decisions. Because in reality, most of the decisions we make on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm sorry to tell you, product managers and managers are wrong. We just don't know. There's too much information. There's too much ambiguity. There's too little of the right information. There's complexity, you said, in the market, also uh, in the needs of the users inside the organizations. Yes, there's a lot of complexity and uncertainty. You never know when your product will run into friction internally. So you need to start small and just iterate and learn and then pivot to the right direction. It's well known. That's the opportunity. That's the other point you dis you mentioned. A lot of people know the big picture. A lot of people know the theory, but how do we bring this into action? How do we actually do it? And that's kind of where I think people like Teresa Torres and myself try to step in and say, here's the way you make the theory practical. And I'm attaching myself to a very high standard. Teresa is great. So I'm trying to do the same thing. Here's how you do discovery in practice essentially. Here's how you get your your managers, your uh, stakeholders, your teammates to collaborate and adopt this model. And that's really the aim of the book, to give you the tools to do exactly these things. So, I mean, we start with the GIST uh, framework and or the GIST board, let's say, uh, but there are other frameworks as well, which we might get into. But I'm curious, when you work with clients, I think GIST is the cornerstone of uh, what you're trying to convey or implement. What is their reaction usually, which you've shared some of it in, in the book, but I'm, I'm also curious, what's their reaction? Plus, what is the point where they go, uh-huh, I, I get 
get it? What's the thing that makes them understand the model? All right, maybe it will help uh, the listeners who are not familiar with just just that I'll give a brief explanation and then I'll answer your question. So just is just a way to break the big challenge of dealing with uncertainty and complexity and developing high impact products in this environment into four parts. Goals, which define what we're trying to achieve. Goals are the things we put into OKRs, typically, if you use OKRs. Ideas, which are features or product enhancements or entire products that we might build, or we may decide to acquire companies. This is another idea. Anything we can do to achieve the goals. This is usually more than one way to achieve the goals. And most ideas are hypothetical. It's really hard to know if they'll work or not. So we're considering multiple ideas per goal. So it's a bit like a tree, if you think about it. And then there are steps. Steps are ways to move forward on the idea a little bit, develop it some more, sometimes just on paper or in concept, and test it and kind of validate the assumptions inside it. So build, measure, learn loops is kind of the core of steps. But you can think of anything from just doing a model on paper all the way to launching a full beta. Each one of those is a type of step. The core principle of step is to start small, to start with the cheap things and learn quickly whether your idea deserves the investment and then go and invest more and more up to the point that you feel we can stop investigating the idea and we can just move into classic delivery mode. That's very important to do. And then the last layer is tasks. Tasks are the things that your team is managing in Kanban or in Jira, the the day-to-day activities, the tickets, the all this good stuff. It's important not to try to disturb this too much. Your team has rituals, your team have ways to deal with, to manage the project, but to connect these things to the steps, to the ideas and to the goals. So your team works with a lot of context and when it's working towards business goals, is empowered to make decisions and is taking active part in discovery as well as delivery. All right, so those are kind of the goals of the task layer. Now to get to your point, um, my clients typically, First, I I ask them to take the the training or now to read the book. And then I ask them, uh, where do you think you're coming shortest out of the four? It's a diagnostic tool as well. Whether or not you're spending a lot of time developing plans, but there's no clear goals and there's no alignment. Whether or not you're investing in the wrong ideas, whether or not you're not testing enough, you're just building, building, building, and then testing in a very late stage. Whether or not your team is very disengaged or your developers are very disengaged and not so interested or seemingly not interested in the users or the business. Each one of those is an indication where you should start. Usually you shouldn't start across the entire stack. Pick one and make that the first priority and then pick another, etc. So it's a gradual thing. Uh, where's the aha moment? Um, it really varies, but usually when I show the conflict confidence meter, especially to executives, it kind of shines a light on on a blind spot. And we should probably explain to the audience what the confidence meter is. But that's something that, in my experience, everyone in the company immediately understands and immediately understand why it's important and why it's missing. And that usually helps a lot with with the discussion. I like, so let's, let me try to explain confidence meter and please correct me if I'm wrong. It's basically puts in all different kinds of data in a scale of, let's say, importance. On one end of the scale is, I heard this customer complain about this issue, or this is what I'm thinking, which gives us a very low confidence because it's a very uh, anecdotal and very qualitative feedback that we get either from ourselves in our head or from one customer, let's say. And on the other end of the scale, we have data from a feature that's launched into the market and we are getting feedback from actual users who are using the product. And that gives us a very high confidence on our thinking. And a confidence meter basically gives us a score around different levels of um, data, whether qualitative or quantitative. It allows us to um, measure our ability to uh, not predict but or project uh, the impact of, of a feature or the effort of a feature, basically. Like how confident are we that this is how much of an impact it's going to have? Like, did we hear it from someone or did we actually test it with real live data? Um, That's a pretty accurate description of it. I would replace the word data with evidence. Evidence is data that actually either confirms or refutes some of our assumptions. It tells a clear story. Data often doesn't say anything. It's just colorless. It's colorless. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a scale of evidence. It organizes it according to categories, as you said, from the very low co- level of confidence, which comes from self-con- self-conviction. You think it's a good idea. Everyone thinks the idea is good. It doesn't give you much. 
or you created a very nice speech deck around the idea or the idea aligns with you know with the web3 okay the web3 is not in fashion now what's now uh, generative machine learning these are all very low level confidence but then you can go into reviews with your colleagues and your managers that's a little bit higher confidence doing some sort of business model on, on paper that's a little bit more but still pretty low because a lot of ideas will pass this test and still be bad. Then you do in, go into data collection, which could be anecdotal. So you have a few data points and you mention this. You talk to a few customers and they say, you know what would be cool? But often just plotting a line through three points of data is just creating patterns in the dark. So be aware of this. Um, another form of anecdotal evidence I see a lot is the competitors. One competitor usually the leading in the market, launches a feature. And internally, we think it's a good feature. Opinions support this. With these two forms of, of, of evidence, everyone's like, let's go, let's build this. It's a sure thing. Obviously, it's not. The competitor doesn't have a crystal ball either. Their situation may be different from yours. You have to go further. And going further means collecting more data. So what I call market data through surveys, through fake door tests, from deep competitive analysis, other forms of research, or from testing the idea, building versions of it, putting it in front of users and measuring the results. There's various forms of tests I talk about in the book, uh, and they give you various levels of confidence. And as you mentioned, the complete confidence, the only time you can say for sure I had a good idea is after you launched it. Absolutely. That's in my book. A 10 out of 10 confidence. Uh, so sorry for repeating, but that's basically how the tool works. So one thing that, you know, this idea of confidence, I'm sure that I read it in my time. And that's why I thought about this when we were uh, in my previous company. It just made sense a lot because it takes out the pressure of like, I need to know the right thing as a PM or as a product leader and just say like, I don't know, but we can find out. Like it gives me, it gives me an out basically of saying like, here are the ways that we can test it. Here are the ways that we can try this idea. And I'm not suggesting that I, that I have the answers. I don't have the answers. I need to have the way of getting the answers. Uh, when I made that switch, that actually relieved a lot of pressure that I was putting on myself uh, ma mainly. And it just turned into like, okay, let's find out. I don't think, I don't know. Let's find out, which is much easier than like, I need to know, you know, the answer to everything kind of a thing. Um, the confidence meter would just made a lot of sense when I saw it as well. Yeah, I, it changes the discussion in different ways. I didn't invent this concept. Uh, confidence came from people before me. I just uh, decided it's so important. I went deeper on it. Um, when I was a PM, I felt this responsibility to somehow build confidence for some market research that I will do or discussion with stakeholders. And then it was binary. Either we knew that this is a bad idea or it's a good idea and boom, just go and build it. And I realized this is false. I couldn't possibly. And once I understood this concept of confidence, it really relieved a lot of load because I don't have to be either completely ignorant and not doing my job or completely sure there's shades of color in the middle. And think about like doing a, a roadmap, for example. For some things, you are pretty sure you already validated them up to the point that you're willing to commit to a delivery. And in the, for these ideas, it's perfectly fine to say we are committing to delivering this idea by May 15th. Absolutely fine. No problem. Because we validated it. Some ideas, we have medium confidence. And there, what we need to say responsibly to our colleagues is we're not sure. It look, there are signs that this might be good. But we need to keep testing. And this is kind of the horizon. And you can follow. We, we, I'm showing ways in the book to communicate internally the status of the steps and what we learned. And when an, we kill an idea, why we killed it. And, you know, the stakeholders, the managers can intervene. And But it's, it's a much simpler discussion. It's not a battle of opinion. I think logically that this is a good idea or you think logically it's not. It's data. It's evidence-based or evidence-guided. So, And some ideas were just... We're excited about them. We think about them, but we have very low confidence. We're just in the level of opinions and sparse data. We cannot possibly commit to them right now until we build our level of confidence. And that gets the entire company to kind of, uh, if they embrace this model, to help you, like to help you find the evidence. If, they, if a stakeholder is bringing an idea, you evaluate it, it looks promising, but there's not enough evidence. This stakeholder is now your partner in finding customers you can test this idea with, or your partner in in collecting market data. And that's that's the way we should be working. How do you convey this way of thinking to 
non-product teams. And by product, I mean product design, development, anyone that's related to building the product. Because I feel like those functions, I think that it's easier for them to get this idea because they're living the problems, they're living the uncertainty. On the other end, the sales and marketing teams, they prefer certainty, especially because they're talking to customers and they feel like they need to offer a certain timeline or a roadmap or a certain level of certainty in their product de- into their product development process, which is understandable. I mean, it's not, it's not, I mean, it has a ground, but it is not really natural to the uncertainty that we see in the product development process. So how do you explain this idea to the non-product people? So first off, I expected them to kick me out of the room when I teach them this stuff or to laugh me out of the room, but I found quite a few interesting things. First off, I found that a lot of them are not super happy with the system as it is now. I mean, uh, first off, we need to divide between B2B and B2C and there's shades in the middle. The most extreme case is B2B enterprise. Like you're building for enterprise customers. You have few customers. Each one is super important. When they come with a request, it feels like it's very high confidence. You didn't, don't, don't need to validate it anymore. What your sales team says is very important. In B2B, it's, in B2C, it's a bit easier because you you have a lot more customers, you have a lot more data to work with. But there, a lot of times, the founder is the problematic person or the, the executive. They think they know. They are consumers themselves or sometimes the team. So it's easier for us to think that we know we don't need to validate. So each type of company has its own struggles with this model. Um, so let's go to the case of the sta- business stakeholders and uh, the, ma- the top management that comes from maybe an MBA uh, business experience. Uh, there's a number of challenges that we need to cross or deal with. One is, and I mentioned, I started saying, they're not super satisfied because what they see a lot of time is black box product management. It's like they come, they think they know it's very clear what we need to do with the product, but then the product team is pushing back or delaying or launching stuff they didn't imagine. And um, they don't understand the decision process so, so much. Sometimes they enforce more process or they, they try to force the product team to, to do more than of they, what they think is right. And I think often they don't realize how complicated it is to build a successful product. All the risks, uh, you know, Kagan's for risks, the, the um, value, usability, feasibility, and viability. They, they only think about the viability part, the business viability, and even that they don't know how to validate very well, with all due respect to all business uh, people listening. Uh, so you need to communicate to them, first off, how hard it is to actually have a successful idea. And sometimes you can do this by doing a uh, historical analysis. You look at last year's roadmap and say, remember all the discussions we had and how convinced you were, and we worked cr- very hard to launch it. And look what happened. We managed to deliver only on half of the roadmap because it turned out to be much more expensive than we thought. And it turned out that those things that we launched actually didn't um, deliver that much. There's a very good uh, product expert called uh, Mitch, uh, Rich Mironov. And he wrote an article explaining how much waste exists in B2B. He specializes in B2B. And he actually did a spreadsheet explaining how to show to your executives how much are you paying every year, every quarter uh, by developing the wrong things. So once you translate it into dollars or euros or liras, they start understanding you a little bit more. The other thing is to uh, explain to them that it's not a battle of opinions. It's not like, if you don't decide on the features, you're actually delegating all the decisions to the product and they will decide. It's We're going to let the evidence decide, right? We're going to make this a fair game. We're going to share with you continuously the research we've done, the steps we ran, what we learned, how we evaluate ideas in a very systematic way. And I suggest ICE here. So it's kind of much more transparent. It's much more controllable and it's working towards their business goals. So. It really depends on the personalities we work with, but a lot of reasonable people will understand why this is actually a better way to work, a more modern way to work, and they actually want it. They just don't know that they can have it. Selam. Bu keyifli bölümü dinlerken çok kısa vaktini alacağım. Size bölüm sponsorumuz Sanction Scanner hakkında bilgi vermek istiyorum. Breaking Bad, Ozark, The Wolf of Wall Street gibi dizi filmleri görmüşsünüzdür. Oradaki kara para aklama sahnelerini hatırlayın. Senede dünyada 2 trilyon, düşünün 2 trilyon dolarlık kara para aklanıyor. Yani filmlerde o gördüklerimiz hiçbir şey. İşte tam burada Sanction Scanner'ın yazılımı devreye giriyor. 
yapay zeka ve makine öğrenmesiyle desteklenen ürünleri banka ve benzeri finansal kuruluşlara gerçek zamanlı EML yani anti-money laundering taramaları yaparak finansal kuruluşla iş yapmak isteyen kişi ve onların işlemlerinin sıkıntılı olup olmadığını analiz ediyor. Şu ana kadar birlikte çalıştıkları 50'den fazla ülkedeki 300'den fazla müşteri için 200 milyon dolarlık şüpheli işlemi engellemişler bile. Sanction Scanner bizi destekledikleri için çok teşekkürler. Sanction Scanner hakkında daha fazla bilgi istersen bölüm notlarındaki linke tıklayabilirsin. Şimdi bölüme geri dönelim. I think this is also a responsibility on the product person as well. They need to communicate that this is a system. That this is not like um, I'm doing whatever I want kind of a thing. Like this is a system that uh, includes everyone including the business teams. Uh, the pro- the sales and marketing teams and uh, the management team so i think it's it's on us as product people to include them in the process and make them feel part of the process as well so it's not only because they don't understand it it's also if they don't they're not understanding it's a two way street i think we're not able to explain it to them so i think we should look at ourselves as well i see product organization where it's very secretive the roadmap is you know the the, the backlog or the idea uh, bank is secretive they just has this very strong sense of us and them they want to kind of protect partly because of lack of confidence because they know that if there was a discussion a true discussion about why this idea is better than the other we don't have a strong evidence to support it so we need to step out we need to be brave and expose our decision processes to them and gradually build trust and with trust you'll get more delegation and more freedom to to make the decisions uh, but without trust we, we just by building walls forget about it i think when i look at your just model um two parts at, at least for me seem like the the challenging part not challenging as in like uh, it's more difficult to perfect i think i think the goal part i think it's very very important and i think writing the right goals writing the right goals is very important because if we're going towards a, a wrong goal then no matter how evidence guided we are i think we're not going to create much impact uh, so i think on the management part we need to understand or the, the management needs to understand the business dynamics well so that we can create the right goals i think that's one thing yeah absolutely <laughs> And it's a huge challenge, uh, partly because a lot of the people, that's just my theory, yeah, but uh, who sit at the top levels come from some sort of background where the best thing to produce is like this very elaborate set of goals, very vague, very generic, full of MBA speak and euphemisms and to do a lot of them and say, we need all of this. And that's not goals. That's not even any remotely close to that. A real goal is like for the how do we run the entire company for the next year with three objectives and each one maybe two or three key results. How do we communicate in the most clear way to the entire organization? And I'm talking about big organizations here. What are the most important things to achieve this year? And it really forces the leaders to be very specific and very determined and to to really step back from this very generic, let's try to catch everything and not offend anyone in the company um, form of goals. And it's hard to do this sometimes with leaders uh, to get them to change this way. And we need as product people to develop the sensitivity and the way to interview our managers sometimes to understand what they really want. What is the most important business goal at the moment? What will really drive success uh, and turn this into our own goals, like to derive it from there. If you have good leadership that knows how to condense things and how to speak very clearly, it helps tremendously. Usually the CPO is the most important person in driving the these changes because they understand the product language and they understand the business language so they should be able to find the best combination of the two yeah i mean uh, among the executives the cpo and sometimes the cto bring kind of the modern product thinking into the world and they need to communicate to the rest listen we need to be much more concrete about what we're asking from our product teams and other teams marketing sales uh, business development everyone It will be much better for them if everything will be concrete and aligned. I'm trying also to explain the book how to align the goals using metrics, using North Star metric, using the top business KPI, using metrics trees, using OKRs, how to get the entire organization to pull in the same direction. Because most organizations are not this way. They're siloed and each silo has its own goals pulling in different directions. Good luck achieving success with that. 
right? I, uh, I, so, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, I mean, I like the fact that you in the book, you don't specify like a, like this is the model that you use to measure goals. Like you use OKR as an example, because it's very well known. Um, and I think it works quite decently in terms of like, you know, having a qualitative objective and some numeric metrics as a key, key result. So I think that's good. And also one thing that when I read, I was like, this is brilliant. Like, you know, it landed on my, in my brain beautifully, like the, the duality of the, the North Stack metric and the, the top business metric. Um, the fact that they're actually like a team, let's say, of one of them generates value and one of them captures the value. Because I've, I've had this discussion before, like I've had the discussion of like, what should be our North Star metric? Should it be revenue? Should it be number of customers? Should it be like to decrease churn? Because those are very, you know, important metrics that we need to take care of. However, what you say is basically the North Star metric is the metric that we, that's usually the product metric that shows that we're generating enough value on the customer and the business metric, the revenue, the number of sales, whatever, is usually the value that we get, that we capture from the customer. Exactly. So I, I, I love that uh, duality of like it balances, those two things balance themselves and it just cleared something in, in my head when I read that. Yeah, uh, I was, I, I didn't invent this uh, concept of the North Star metric. And when I discovered it, I thought that's brilliant. And and this is a concept that WhatsApp and Airbnb and Facebook and a lot of companies use. So it measures the total amount of value we're creating to the market, the me- number of messages sent, the number of people connected, the number of uh, people who find insight in your tool. Uh, these are all measures of how well you're serving your market. And I immediately connected with this because I'm a product person, you're a product person, we are focused on customer value. And then I started presenting it to companies and immediately, yeah, the executive said, yeah, we have an hostile metric, it's profit, or we have an hostile metric, it's market share or the, the share of Fortune 500 companies that we're in the our customers. And I was trying to explain to them, listen, you're not getting this. This is a super important thing. And eventually I, I realized I am not getting it. A company has this duality of purpose. We both need to create value, but we also need to capture value. These people are completely right. It's better to make it explicit and say there's not just one top metric. There's probably two, and probably there are others as well about the health of the company and the well-being of the customers and their satisfaction. There's a set of top-level metrics, but at least these two, how much value we're creating and how much value we're capturing. And if these two are not growing and growing in sync, we have problems. Maybe we're over exploiting our market and not get, giving them a lot of uh there's a gap between how much money we're getting much, how much money we're delivering that's an opening for a competitor to step in and offer a better product or maybe we're just creating a ton of value but we're not monetizing a lot of startups fell into this trap uh so you need to make sure that to monitor these two very important metrics and show that they're growing and set targets for them and try to act on them. And that also helps a lot of product people because when I meet product managers, they're very conflicted. Am I doing the right thing for the customer or am I doing the right thing for the business? The answer is you need to do both. You need to develop ideas for both. You need to set goals for both. And it's it's legitimate. That I think that was the thing that made it click in my head because it, it, there were times where we had to choose like there, there were times where we had to be like okay are we going after revenue are we going after let's say active users like uh, what, what are we going after are we going after like product usage metrics or are we going after business metrics and it just i mean having it next to each other like no we're going after the two both of them yes okay it makes sense but like putting it under the the label of like delivering value and capturing value that i think that you know it clicked in my head I have a question on on that though. What about the time lag? Because you generate the value, but then getting like capturing the value might take time. Let's say B two B SaaS. Um, you to simplify things, we published, uh, we launched a a feature that's very important that we think that's going to generate uh, a lot of money and new customers. Let's say, but we have a thirty day free period. So the KPI that we're going to see is probably going to be plus thirty days. So how do we track the time lag in between delivering the value and capturing the value? Uh, first, I don't know that you necessarily have to to connect the two constantly and make sure that they're working in sync. Um, I think as a long-term trend, that's what you want to see. Like when you track 
quarter over quarter, year, year over, the, over year, you want to go see both of them exponentially growing and uh, connected. On a regular basis, when you are doing some sort of uh, product launch, you usually have some metrics in mind, some targets. And they can fall under the metrics tree of the Nostal metric, or they can fall under the metrics tree of the top business metric. And often there's a lot of overlap. So some metrics actually contribute to, to both. What's important is just to track that the metric you, you think should improve, should improve. Even that takes time, especially in large B2B. So sometimes you're looking for some early indicators that's from your metrics tree that say, if this changes, typically this will change eventually too. So retention, 90 day retention, sometimes you need to look for seven day retention first to, to see if, if we're moving in the right direction, right? So stuff like that. I don't know if I answered your question. I mean, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be connected as like from A to B, like straight connection, but it, they're usually in sync is basically what you're saying. I believe so. And just between us, I think of the two, the no style metric is the more important. Because we know a lot of companies somehow survive, but they fail to grow because they're not creating value and they're not tracking how much value they're creating. And they're looking at their business metrics and they're all kind of not moving anywhere. And that's because they don't, they're not creating value. On the flip side, a company that creates tremendous value has a slightly, still very hard challenge, but slightly easier to find ways to monetize this, to find ways to, to capture value back. It's much easier to start with the value. That's why people like uh, Mark Andreessen, for example, or uh, you know some of the Silicon Valley most successful people believe in, in the model of product market fit. First and foremost, focus on delivering enough value to a segment of a market, they will fall in love with your product and start pulling and asking for more and then start worrying about sales and marketing and all this good stuff. Don't start from there. Start from product market fit. And they see this as a sequence of things for startups. And I think that's true for also from all larger companies. When we launch a new product, when we launch a new feature, don't expect from day one to for the revenue to flow. Focus first on the indications that you're creating the value. And then most likely what you want to see on the business side will happen as well. Makes sense. Um, so remember, I was saying like there are two parts that I feel like it's challenging. The first one was the goals. The second one, I think, is the step, steps part. Um, the after framework that you have, the different ways of validating your ideas or basically getting evidence from the market on your idea. I think like... The data analysis part, user interview part, we're more accustomed to it. But um, the tests, the usability tests, whether like the fake door tests, concierge tests, uh, Wizard of Oz, tests, th those things or like prototypes, I think those things are skills that people need to gain. I think they need to know because they read about it and it makes perfect sense. But when you when you start doing it, I think you realize, huh, okay, there are things that I need to figure out first. Um, I think this is something like the steps part. I think that's something that it's, is a skill set that people need to learn either by doing or by, you know, reading or you know going to your courses and stuff like that yeah totally um to for me personally this is the most fun part of the work honestly like uh, running experiments and testing and measuring the results of users and and analyzing it because there's two sides for it it's running the experiments and also analyzing the results and learning from that which is another skill that a lot of people miss. Um, I think it's hard also because a lot of companies are not set up this way. They're set up to deliver. They're set up to create a roadmap and then just to try to deliver on the roadmap as fast as possible. And as fast as possible in their mind is to just go ahead into full-on building mode, delivery mode, and churn, churn, churn through the code, you know, through iterations, through Kanban, through sprints, whatever it is, and then launch it and then discover what happens. And they know they need to learn, so they bake one or two tests in the middle, and that's it. That's uh, that's the entire validation. And what I created the after model for, and just for your viewers, the after model is just a list of the, the, the various ways you can validate the assumptions in your idea. From starting from assessment, which is just coming up with uh, guesstimates and numbers and interviewing your stakeholders and stuff like that, to uh, fact finding, which is digging for data internally or externally, but without developing anything. And then you have tests, 
but early tests, as you mentioned, are faking the product. They are not building it. So fake door tests or Wizard of Oz or Concierge. And then you have mid-level tests where you build a very rough version and test it. That's what most people think of when they say MVP. But uh, there's alphas and, and other f- forms. And then latest where it's a much richer version of the product. And finally, you have experiments, which are A-B tests and uh, release results as well. You can use the, a gradual release to learn even more. So these things go from the very cheap that you can do in minutes to the very expensive where it takes you quarters sometimes. And what I try to teach is start from the, the A and the F, assessment and fact finding, get good at this. These things don't require a lot of effort or a lot of expertise often. And then, yeah, develop your skills at, t- at faking the product, at finding ways to validate your assumptions without building anything. And I meet people who constantly tell me it's impossible. I'm in a regulated uh, industry. I'm in B2B. My customers will never go for it. And then within 10 minutes, we figure out five different ways that they can do it, actually. It's, it's not that hard. It's just pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Yeah, I think it's a mindset change. I'm saying I'm like smiling because I've uh, experienced that myself. Like even of like trying to do like the fake door tests, like we did a couple of them. And then the first time that I did it, I was like, I know that I need to do this. But I had this idea in my, my like in, in me that I was like, we're, f- you know, are we defrauding the customer? Like, (laughs) are we, you know, are we doing something wrong? But it's obviously not. We're just trying to get evidence or we're just trying to get data on there or we're trying to get feedback from them, basically. Uh, But I I do get that. I do get that it's it's something that we're not used to. Um, So I think that's why I'm saying like there needs to be a culture in the team and there needs to be people who are experienced with these, even if they're not people who are willing to do this, these tests. So I think they're important. Yeah, I, it's really hard. Uh, I mean, I, I teach this, but when I it came to a new type of project to write this book, for example, I made this exactly the same mistake. I waited way too long to beta test it. I, I spent like 14 months perfecting it and polishing it and writing something. And then I, I recruited my first beta cohort and I gave it to them. And everyone was like, yeah, mm, you're on the right direction, but <laughs> there's some, uh, and most of them didn't really go very far in the book, and which is a very bad indication. And then I kind of read the feedback and I realized I'm confusing a lot of people. I'm giving too much theory that people don't care about and too much historical background and too little concrete advice, not addressing some of their key questions. I wish I knew this six months ago. I could have saved myself so much time. Was there a way to test this earlier? Probably yes. I just didn't push myself. I just did what was comfortable for me, which was just to write and polish, which is the equivalent of building an MVP, which isn't minimal at all. You know, that's what we do in product. So push yourself. Do the most embarrassing thing you can do and put it out there. And don't worry. The customers will not feel bad. The customers will not hate you for it. And on the contrary, your team and your stakeholders, when you come with this early evidence and you say, listen, I learned something really important about this important idea that we're all setting up to build, they will actually appreciate it a lot. And and they will say, do more of this in most organizations, at least that that I've seen. I think... um... I'm sure that you've uh, experienced this yourself, but I think when people read this book, they will probably think, yeah, but this is not going to work in my company or in my industry or like this, I need to convince the CEO, I need to convince the product leader to do this. And you mentioned something about the book, uh, you mentioned something like about this in the book as well. But um, for those people, what do you suggest? So adoption is the biggest challenge by far. Let's not kid ourselves. There's a whole set of threads on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter of rants of people saying, hey, I read all these books. They don't apply to me. They talk about some ideal situation in Silicon Valley, but my life is very different. So it's not a book for me. And that's an understandable reaction. I think uh, a lot of us live in, uh, in imperfect realities. And a lot of people will have this reaction when they read my book. I know this in advance and I apologize to them. In my experience, and sorry for saying this, the difference between the companies that manage to make the leap and those that don't, because every company is in, is not in a perfect situation. Even those idealized companies you think are ideal, the Googles, the Airbnbs, etc., they're not ideal at all. They have a lot of these challenges internally. What really helps is that they are trying at least. 
they know they need to to move. They're trying to push themselves. They're setting ambitious but achievable goals of changing the mindset, of changing the way we work. Let me just give you an example, a concrete example of what as a solitary product manager you can do. Let's say that... Um, I'll give you two. One is in goals and one is in experimentation. So let's say your manager always comes to you with output goals, with features. Build this, build that. This was decided. You don't like it. You don't believe in many of these features. You don't want to be just a project manager. You want to be given business goals, right? One technique is to start interviewing, to learn to interview your manager and ask, yeah, this Sounds like a good idea. Why Why are we doing this? What metrics do you think will change? What will? What's the context? And gradually from the discussion, you will understand which metric really you need to move here. Or what's the outcome? And then you need to learn to politely ask, do you mind if we add this outcome as well to the goals? Like to, to improve, just so we see that we're successful, right? And they may say, yes, okay, but I still want you to launch this thing. And then later, and that's part two of my recommendation, go and start collecting evidence. Do some surveys, do some interviews, do some things without permission. Don't ask permission. Just go and do them and come with evidence and say, you know what I found? There's a couple of other ideas that people seem to, our customers seem to resonate with very strongly. And I think they can actually impact that key metric potentially even more than the, the other one. Do you mind if we take all three and we test them and we, we keep testing? That's the toughest part of the discussion. The wrong manager will tell you, no, forget about it. Just go ahead and do what I told you and stop wasting time. And that's a signal that maybe you should start brushing up on your CV and uh, look for a different place to work. Uh, it's a luxury, of course. Not everyone can do that. Uh, but mostly, I think what the manager will see is, oh, interesting. I didn't consider this. Let's not waste too much time on this. But yeah, let's try to to look at these other ones too. And if you can, if you will, you need to just bring them into this world to show them the benefits, to show them that it's helping their cause. And gradually you can make a difference. Much better if the manager already knows. And a lot of managers do know, but they too are forced. They are also forced from the above to, to act rather than to think. Uh, but together you can do, you can do a lot. So push yourself, try it. I know it's, Art. And buy them a copy of Evidence Guided. <laughs> I didn't say this. You said that. Uh, <laughs> I did the promotion. I did the promotion. Uh, but no, I mean, uh, all joking aside, I think nobody is, I don't like evidence. Nobody says that they don't like evidence. They don't, nobody says that they don't like data. I think everyone on paper agree and understand the importance of working with evidence or data. Um, so I think they want to, maybe they just, don't know or they need some guidance or they need you know step-by-step -step progress towards that so i think everybody has that view in them just i think it's a journey i think it's a journey of learning i think it's a journey of like changing one's mindset absolutely um, and I, I assure you even after they agree they will find creative ways to subvert the the process like uh, i've seen all sorts of things like uh yeah no, it's true we need market evidence the opinion of the senior vp of marketing is is equivalent to market evidence it's like uh my opinion as a single person you need to boost it times 10 in order to satisfy me and uh, you need to learn to deal with this it's uh, sometimes people's egos and situations you need to create coalitions manage the politics uh it, it's it's not easy it's really the hardest part but um it's not a magic pill basically you know no there's no magic solution a lot of these problems are not product problems or, or business problems these are cultural problems they go back to the the way the company operates and what it believes. And these are things that take time to change, but there's multiple uh, ways of changing. One is to try to change people's philosophy. You teach them the philosophy and the principles and good luck, yeah, changing a business person's mind this way. And the other way is you show them, you change the context around them, you show them that they can achieve business results in collaboration with the product in a different way than what they're used to or what they were taught. And that changes their perspective and then they change also their beliefs. So I believe more in the second than the first. So basically don't talk, just do. And then you have a better chance of convincing them. Yeah. Show them. Show them rather than uh, all the techniques we mentioned, like showing them a spreadsheet that shows how much money we're wasting through the roadmap process is showing. It's it's not just, don't come, just come and try to convince them with 
the philosophy of product development because their worldview is very different. Try to show them evidence that you can improve by, by adopting your method. Also, I'm, I'm sure they're going to say, they're not going to say no to that philosophy. I'm sure they're going to say, that sounds great. How? And then they're going to, you know, give it back to you and say like, okay, so how, how do we do that? So I think, I think in philosophy, they're not going to, most of them are not going to say no, let's say. They'll have reservations, whatever, but in, in, in principle, I think they're going to agree. That's exactly right. Itamar, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been lovely. And uh, thank you for writing this book. Uh, I will definitely share it in the, the podcast notes and also a couple of your blog posts as well to give uh, the listeners, if they don't know it already, because we shared it in our Slack channel of Uritimbanda Slack channel. Some of your articles have already been uh, shared, uh, but I'll put those in the show notes as well. And yeah, thank you for your time and sharing your experiences. No, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to talk to the Turkish product community. I don't know about you guys nearly enough, and I would love to to, to learn more about what you guys are doing. And thank you for for considering my uh, my content. That's uh, the biggest uh, compliment I can get. Absolutely, it was a pleasure. Uh, and thank you everyone for listening. And hope to see you in the next episode. Ürün yönetimi eğitimlerimize üretim bandı adıyla başladık ve şimdi Brick Institute markası altına devam ediyor. Brick Institute'da sektörün lider şirketlerinden katılımcılar ve deneyimli eğitmenlerle birlikte uygulamalı, dünya standartlarında eğitimler sunuyoruz. Bugüne kadar yüzlerce arkadaşımız bu eğitimlere katıldı. Amacımız gerçek vaka çalışmalarından oluşan, sadece teoride kalmayan, elleri kirleterek öğreten eğitimler düzenleyerek sektöre dünya standartında ürün geliştirenler yetiştirmek. Haydi birbirimizden öğrenelim ve topluma fayda sağlayacak teknolojik ürünler geliştirelim. Kayıt aldığımız eğitim programlarımızı görmek için www.brick.institute linkini ziyaret edebilir ya da selam.brick.institute adresinden bizimle iletişime geçebilirsin.